I was making millions. I just had it in a joint bank account. And what happened? He emptied them too. Gita Sidorov wants organizations to create safe and inclusive environments for women where they can succeed. Welcome to W Corp. I made that money that we lived in. I just wasn't looking after it because I was busy having babies. Mm -hmm. And so I opened myself up to that kind of abuse. How do I help another woman who doesn't have a voice? She was saying like the B Corp and my brain blew up and I was like, oh my God. W -core. This infrastructure doesn't work. It's not broken. Broken implies it's not working. Actually, it's only not working for women because it's not a broken pipeline for men. We should have infrastructure in place that just enables women to be women. You can go to an organization which has a W Core stamp on it and you know you don't have to take on that fight. Have you had any backlash from men about W Core? The only backlash I've had is from... Hello, my fellow leaders. Welcome back to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. This week, I sit down with Gita Sidorov, an entrepreneur, a life coach, and an activist, having founded W Corp, a certification and a movement to help organizations become spaces where women, whose needs largely have been ignored, can thrive. As a headhunter, I speak with a lot of female senior executives, and I often think about how to advise them on where they can go to next. What should they look out for when assessing whether an organization is going to be invested in their success? And W Corp may just be the answer. I hope Gita's story inspires you to find courage within yourself. I learned a huge deal from the guests on the show. And last week when I was speaking to the TikTok comedian Clara Batten, I realized that I need to take my own advice, which is taking a show to a real life audience with you. If you'd like to meet IRL, go to the link in comments to be added to a list to receive early access. Please follow and subscribe to the show. It makes the world of difference. Without further ado, here is Gita Sidhu Rob. Gita, welcome to Anatomy of a Leader. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you. I mean, I've seen you on Instagram. I know about W Corp. I am so excited to talk about that because I think it's really the revolutionary thing we need in the workplace. So we'll get around to that. But for those people who don't know you, can you give a, like a two minute introduction? So I'm going to like hold you to that, like very, very, very brief so people can get to know you a little bit. Um, yeah, I can do less than two minutes. I'm um, a Sikh Indian woman born and brought up in Malawi. So I'm very African. And I came out here to go to school when I was 15 because, you know, colonization. And I stayed. And um, I became a parent, a mother in my 20s. And then I became a single mother, single parent uh, in my early 30s. And I've been a single parent my entire life. Um, and I'm an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurship was we we was was the the key to freedom for us. It fed, clothed, housed, and educated us, uh, my children, and that's pretty much all I am. Yeah, well, it was very very brief. It was, <laughs> it was brief. but in terms of what I care about, oh, I'm a cat. I have cats. Um, <laughs> those are the things I care about. Mm. And talk to me about growing up. What was that like for you? You know, we grew up in, uh, Malawi is very small and very poor, but it wasn't at the time. Um, so we've had a lot of um, <laughs> development democracy, which has been very painful on many levels. Um, it was small. It was sheltered. Uh, we were very wealthy. My parents were very well known. So we was growing up in a goldfish bowl. It was very specific, you know, as, as, as an upbringing. And I look back now, everything happens to help you to do the things as you get older, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I spent a lot of time on my own, a lot, a lot of time on my own. Um, Deliberately so? No, I didn't have any choice because if you wanted to go somewhere, somebody had to take you there mm -hmm. because you didn't walk places. You know, you have to be driven. You're you're sitting on, on in, in this home. And and if you were going places, you couldn't choose where you were going because that's how I, I'm an Indian girl from an upper-class Indian family. This, that was my upbringing. Um, so the only freedom I had was in my mind. And so I honed that, I think, to a very large extent. I kind of relate to that because, yeah. well, I grew up in a very tiny town in Siberia, in the middle of nowhere in Russia, but we were very, very poor. And then when we moved to Moscow, so as my stepfather started traveling a lot and, you know, we started doing better, 
And there, all of a sudden, like all the freedom that I had was kind of like taken away. You can't go anywhere on your own. Yes. You have to be in the car. Something's going to happen to you. The fear. And it was it like all of a sudden your world has become really large because you live in a large city, but also really tiny. So, yeah, it's the fear of where you have to like watch your back a little bit. I mean, it was a difficult period of time in Russia at the time anyway. But I, I guess what, what year I was nine. So this was can't do the maths very quickly so we moved to london in 94 and we lived so it was like early 90s i was in moscow actually yeah. st petersburg in moscow 94 through to 97 interesting so yeah i lived there i lived there my son's half russian interesting so what brought you to russia you know i just <laughs> i'm one of those people that never really said no to things okay i was very clear about me mm-hmm. and my boundaries and my body and those things but in terms of adventure and experience, I very rarely say no. Unless, but, but, okay, I'm trying to think how to put it. So I have very clear ideas about what I want and don't want. And that's very helpful because you're forced to learn those, right? Um, and then outside of that, I never say no. Somebody goes, do you want to come in? I'm like, yes. You want to jump off a building? I'm like, yes. I used to upsell down big buildings. People would be like, I'm sending a plane. Do you want to come? Yes. And I look back now and I say to my kids, please don't do any of those things. <laughs> like, <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> no, and they know, though, because I've been very kind of open about it. Um, and so one of those was I had just finished my master's at the London School of Economics. And um, one of my American buddies was like, hey, Gida, come to Moscow. We're just like setting up this firm, a law firm. And I was like, oh, OK. So I flew to Moscow and set up this law firm with them and worked with them and ended up, um, yeah, ended up with a man. And I ended up uh, happily pregnant. I mean, I wanted to be. And then I came home. Mm. so yeah so that's my track so we so Balawi very sheltered and what what happened in between that and ending up in Moscow uh, I just went to school mm. um and I carried on going to school and I went to school in a few I went to school in Switzerland and in France and then I came back and then I um and did you feel less sheltered when you were doing that when you were in school there was no sheltering I mean there was no sheltering because I was there, my parents were at home, and there was no sheltering. So I went from, you can't do anything without being observed, to, meh, do whatever. And, the, you know, I look at that now, and I'm a bit, you know, like, sorry, what the heck? Um, I would never do that to my kids. In fact, I haven't done that to my kids. I've been very clear about that. Um, and I just was like, and my father loved to travel, so we grew up traveling a lot. And so that was always high on my list of things I was going to do. And then I went to law school because my father made me. (laughs) Mm. Doctor, lawyer, accountant, marriage or death were the choices. (laughs) In fact, I'd be laughed because my father pushed us so hard. Both my my brother and I both ended up as lawyers. And I was working as a lawyer and I got married at 24. Um, And yeah. And then I wanted babies and he, after getting married, decided he didn't want them anymore. And then so the marriage was falling apart. Then the Americans turned up and said, come to Moscow. I was like, meh, why not? So I'd rocked up to Moscow. Interesting. Yeah. Didn't speak the language. So that was interesting. So there's there's this undercurrent of of rebel. Oh, no, overcurrent. I'm like, I don't really hide it. I'm still, (laughs) yeah, to my dying day, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, but that I, I really thank, my, I, I want to thank my father for that. It turns out that when my mother was younger, apparently my mother was a raging rebel. When you find, meet people that knew my mother, mm-hmm. they were like, it's, it's in it's the a, genes. Uh-huh. <laughs> there was a, and I didn't find this out till my, my 20s, but apparently if there was a, a protest or something somewhere, my mother would be the one leading it. You would not believe that as your mother, having this woman, you know, who was very clear, and very rigid and very disciplinarian. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so it was like, off you go, go do go be what do you want to do who do you want to be um and so highly rebellious i'm i'm highly motivated by a by a sense of injustice and i'm highly motivated by being told no which to me is always the start of a conversation it's like a trigger it, it's not even a trigger it's an on switch trigger just is too mild i i'm deeply deep all of me switches on mm-hmm. With no, and I, I mean, I'm now older, so I've learned to hide it a little bit better, you know, <laughs> just 
He's a, but yeah, no, highly rebellious, highly rebellious. Mm. In an old day, I'd have been a freedom fighter somewhere. Mm. <laughs> I would have. In fact, I am a freedom fighter. In fact, that's how I see myself. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So this sort of rebellious streak, what? rebellious identity, coupled with like, you must go and become a lawyer because... You know, I understand within like cultures, yeah. it's like that's, you know, you only have like three or four options. Did you want to be a lawyer? No. So no. how did that play out? I just hated it. I hate, I couldn't conform. I couldn't wear the right clothes and behave in the right way because it didn't mean anything to me. And I never do anything that doesn't mean anything to me. I listen to this now and I'm like, Lordy, I must have been so difficult to manage. But I'm just not employable, I don't think. And not if you're an idiot. I'm highly unemployable if I think you're stupid. Um, and yeah, I just, I couldn't do it. So then I went off and I worked for a small firm and then I went and I, and I wanted one of those great big jobs, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> I was just not suited for it. And then I ended up doing like a corporate job. Yeah. Yeah. I really wanted a corporate job, but I only wanted it for the money. Mm-hmm. I didn't want it for anything else. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, oh, well, that's not happening. So what was that experience like? So you're like, okay, I want this big corporate job. I want the money. I never fit in. Mm-hmm. That's what that was like. I never fit in. I never fit in. I never. And then also my parents had stayed home. So we came out. So it all became an isolating thing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, if I can't do anything with anyone, I'll do everything for me by me and help people that haven't got anything. Mm -hmm. And then that's it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then I created two versions. And and it's very interesting because I speak to I have a lot of very famous clients as, as, as life happens. And I was listening to one of them and he was saying that He said, well, the thing is that, I mean, these are like globally famous people. And he said, the way you do it is really interesting. You take about 60% of yourself and you open that up fully. And then the remaining 40%, you never let anyone near because it is kept only for those people. And I was like, oh my God, that's what I do. Mm -hmm. That's a hundred million percent. Like this, I have no problem with any of these conversations and I have them regularly and I'm super open about it. Mm -hmm. But the bit that's me, that's mine, that's that like three people Mm -hmm. I will be that person with. Where does that come from? Being the children of very wealthy, very well-known people. Mm -hmm. 100%. Mm -hmm. And also always being not quite right. So I never needed, you need to protect yourself so that being accepted isn't part of what you want. And the only way to do that is to keep the real you to you. So Mm -hmm. if somebody doesn't like you, they're not liking this bit of you and that's okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's quite, there's probably a really great psychological term for that. There probably is. I'm trying to like wreck my brain to what it could be, you know, or I've, you know, I've had some exposure to what it's like to kind of like live a rich life. But through the experiences that I've had, like, you know, knockbacks, personal, you know, traumas, divorce, deaths, you know, you, you, what I have learned to do is to intellectualize a lot of what has happened to me, that I'm able to like articulate and say things about my life that, kind of oh you know you're being really really open but at the same time like the core things that I you know probably like deeply hurt me are reserved for the people who I only feel like very very comfortable with so it's like it's like a it's like a mask but it's based on reality and then you have like your little like maybe it's like a cancerian thing not that I'm a huge follower of astrology but it's like the, the shell and the soft and being able to, I guess, be both. So what I would say, the way I see it, is, is yes, that version of me, I think, did exist. But I see there's layers. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember a meeting this. I, I was in Saudi Arabia doing something. Um, I was listing a company, which is another story. And I was talking to the guy. We were having a conversation. It was very funny because there was a room full of um Americans there was me and this guy and they said something and we both looked down and then we both looked at each other and we both looked down I'm a woman and this guy is a very very powerful Saudi it's not like he gives a shit what I think and doesn't need to because of the culture that he lives in but there was a place where there was a pure meeting of minds and he said they don't understand that we will go home and eat with our hands hmm. and that was the thing there are layers so the way that the if you grew up in poverty that will always be a layer in your existence on some level if I grew up very, very, very restricted, that will always be a layer 
in my existence, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Because, and, and it's the people that know you really well that know that those are the things that you come from. And there are the people that don't know you well. Like, I will say things like, I'm really quite introverted. You know, I'm very good on camera and on stages, but actually I'm quite introverted. And I do, I do kind of, you know, like if I have to walk into a room full of people, I, I will oh, not quite, I, I'll struggle. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'll have people that know me, but not very well, will laugh and go, you're not introverted. Yeah. I'm like, mm. and then we all move on. But it's just not true. I'm highly introverted, but I'm a highly functioning introvert. So what do you what do you define as being introverted versus extroverted? What is the, because this is a really interesting subject for me because I feel like I'm a little bit of both. Like I'm I can be very introverted when I can be extroverted and I can get my energy from being on my own and being with other people. But it depends on the day. I, I've been in the public eye for a very long time. So just just to put that out there as a, as a, as a concept, mm-hmm. right? So some of these conversations almost are conversations I, can't, I don't know how to have, and I'm highly self-aware because I've been in the public eye for so long that a lot of the things I do are things I have just learned and moved on, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so it's like, like the mean, skill of presenting. Yes. Yeah. So uh, introvert, I, I had like two people, three people, I was going to say, if I had my kids, I have four people that I go to that feed me, Mm -hmm. that I would look for, that I would search for. And that's it. Honestly, that's it. And then outside of that, I'm just doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I enjoy people. I have fun. I laugh. I do all of those things. And it's a beautiful, wonderful experience. But... In terms of feeding myself, it's a very self-motivated thing. I so I think extra. I look my young, my eldest daughter, my next one down, my middle child is high is an extrovert, and I watch her, and she goes out with people because it brings her joy and happiness, and she's just buzzing, and she comes home and she feels complete. Never, interesting, like never. Mm-hmm. Um, I can be happy and come back, but I I, I just don't know that. Does that make sense? I just, so I, I'm actually, honestly, truly at heart, raging introvert. But I grew up like that. I grew up in the middle of nowhere alone. And that's how I feed. Mm-hmm. And that's how I f- re- regenerate. Mm-hmm. And it's how I do all those things. So um, everything else is is high functioning. Mm-hmm. Interesting. I'm kind of relating it back to my own upbringing because I think I experienced both being an only child for the first 14 years of my life spending a lot of time by myself, figuring out how to entertain myself. But then this, at the same time, being part of this like big network of my parents, like friends and being like big parties and like lots of people yes, being around. Yes, because you guys are very similar to us. We grew up like that too. Yeah, so then you have like one extreme and then you have like the other extreme. And and I do get energy, I do get energy from both, which is what I realized. I find, yeah, and I find that if I spend too long alone, it becomes, but then, you know, that's a while. And Intro- introverts need social Everybody needs social interaction. Absolutely. Yeah. But I thought about it because I get a lot of pushback on being an introvert, which always makes me laugh because you mm-hmm. should always know yourself better than someone else does, right? Um, and I, I, I really, I'm heavily on the introverted scale, mm-hmm. but I just can't spend all my time together because I grew up in a house with five children and there was a lot going on. Mm-hmm. I not grew up. I mean, I brought up five kids. So there was a very busy household, you know? Yeah. So to have nothing in my house for days and days and days, that that's difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've done that. And I was like, no, no, no. So you, so I need the social interaction, but not in the same way an extrovert would. So, okay. Malawi, Russia, England. England, well, Switzerland, lots of, you know, places. uh, And then back to England. And then back to England. And so how many kids have you got then? (laughs) So I gave birth to three. Mm -hmm. And so my single parenting has been of three children. Mm -hmm. And then I entered into a relationship um, after a while. Um, My my late, uh, my early 40s. And he had two kids. Mm -hmm. And so, but they were really little. And so I brought up for half the time, five kids. Mm-hmm. So it was just what I did. Mm-hmm. And I didn't really, it was nice. It was good. I would have happily had more kids. Why did you not? Um, because bringing up three alone was really hard. And then when I ended up in this relationship, it was like, yeah, 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 of course we should have more kids. And then when I was in the relationship, it was like, no, I didn't really mean it. I was like, really? So I was like, do I now stop? 
and go and take away what my my children's father mm. you know in, in essence and do but that that hurt me that really hurt me i really wanted more kids i wanted a huge house full of kids mm. i mean i kind of had a huge house full of kids mm. well they well you have you have five so you know not not biological but they are they're there they are there of, out of the i never of your yeah, life. yeah yeah they are mm. and so talk to me through the experience. and i have a lot of god kids okay <laughs> I've, I've 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 acquired children <laughs> along the way so i have um mm-hmm. got daughters mm-hmm. so talk to me about the experience of single parenthood what happened there <sighs> just makes me want to cry when i look back actually i I'm, i'm that that's some place where i'm very vulnerable because i just you know it was so hard mm-hmm. it was so hard it was i don't know how to have these conversations and make them sound good it was hard mm-hmm. and my eldest son was so ill and he had anaphylaxis so he had to constantly be able to go into hospital at the drop of a hat because he would get uh, cardiorespiratory you know issues and he actually died once and had to be resuscitated and he was in intensive care it was just horrendous and so there was no there was just no one to depend on there was no one to talk to there was no one to rely on um unless i married somebody or i slept with somebody and i was like that's just a shitty reason Mm-hmm. to to have a relationship and i i'm starting with no right so of course i'm not going to do that um but it was hard mm-hmm. everything was hard it just was not yeah it was hard i'm sorry about yeah that. yeah it really was i mean to make a to make the decision to i guess to put yourself in that position also i mean it's not an easy one i know a lot of women struggle when they're I want to cry on camera. Oh, bless. Can we can I have a tissue? Mm-hmm. This is unusual for me. <laughs> um okay, tell me. No, I mean I um we can have I mean I feel like it's obviously touched your, you know, a nerve for you. So I yeah, want to make sure that you're okay. I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. It mm-hmm. just is You know, it's it's insanely difficult. It's and the more work I do around stuff like the womanist movement and W Core, it makes me more vulnerable because I remember how bad it is for women and that's really causing me a lot of memories to come up. Because mm-hmm. I kind of dealt with the process and I was like how do I become the strongest most powerful version of myself and I've done that very successfully. Mm-hmm. But this work I'm doing now is really t- pressing all my buttons mm-hmm. and making me deal with things that I obviously just didn't deal with because who had time to do is shit when you're trying to feed three kids and yeah. put them in school and not be homeless. Yeah. You know. Um and so it's just really hard for women. I think it's very hard. And I think we we underestimate the level of pain and trauma there is behind single mm-hmm. parent single single motherhood. Mm-hmm. Because women are always poorer and they're they're they they my daughter would go to school and they would say things like the children of single parents do much worse in in jobs and my daughter would go well my mother's a single parent they'd be because she was in this very posh um mm-hmm. school and there'd be this complete silence and then the only way i made money was by you know i made a hard rule for myself that that i wouldn't marry or have sex for money because sometimes it was so tempting because mm-hmm. it would've been so easy mm-hmm. you know and i had to really decide was this something i was going to do or not and i was like okay so i'm not going to do that so then what else am i going to do you do learn yourself very well when you're poor you learn who you are and um i got a lot of work on it sounds really stupid to say this but it was part of the, what i had done a lot of work on tv a lot of stuff i was doing speaking all of these things that's what i was good at and then you know like when there was a big piece in the papers my youngest she only told me this about 3 years ago that she would walk into school and she was only poor thing she was 11 she 11 yeah 11 or 12 and they would have me plastered on all of the computers as she walked in because it was like oh well and this is chance mummy was showing you know how her life and you'd be like you know why are you hurting a child mm-hmm. and so it took me a long time to get to this place where i can my kids are safe and now i can go and do the things i want to do because people would attack my kids for the things i was doing because i just didn't conform they wanted me to conform and they wanted me to behave in a particular way and if i didn't the places i was vulnerable was the babies mm. and they kept a lot of it right they don't they didn't tell me but a lot of single mother kids do that mm. they look after their mothers and it's not i'm i always used to be this is not your job it's my job to look after you you know 
I think it's hard to. How do I explain this? With I think I'm just gonna have to go. I mean, my mum, she, she remarried, and the reason why I'm in London is because of my stepfather. Because you know he became famous, you know he made money, you know we this we were able to afford this life, but they didn't stay together, and that process of divorce, especially when my mum had my brother and sister, they were two years old. That moment in time was so hard mm. for her, for, for us. And because I was, you know, 16, like you understand, you know, you could be a it yourself. And like technically I, I was with my brother and sister who were, you know, two years old, like taking my mom to the, her antenatal appointments to, you know, do my GCSEs while, you know, babysitting them for, because, you know, the nanny wasn't there. So you kind of, I got to see what the ugly side of that could be as a woman, where you're completely reliant on somebody else, that you don't have your own autonomy and you're completely reliant on the person to provide for you. And when that no longer works, how ugly it can get. Did you still have a relationship with your stepfather? Well, unfortunately, he passed away. That's a whole other story that one day I will say, but it's it's a very, very difficult one. Mm. I think it's one of the most life-defining things that happened to me. Mm. And why I felt so connected to what you're doing is probably as a result of the experience that I went through, not directly myself, but observing how your parent, um, your mother, not parent, how your mother is affected because... Even though she never talked about it directly to us, we can feel it. It's like you you sense it. And so when you're talking about your kids, how, you know, they try to support, they, they sense it too, like 100%. But I think also that there's, you know, and I've talked about this. I don't talk about this with them because we'd have to be way more grown up to do that or more drunk. Um, <laughs> but I do, I, I do feel that my children have a level of anger mm-hmm. around some of these things. Um, and, and I, you know, I 100%, I see it and I understand it, but staying would have been worse. And that's really what they understand. So, but you've got to, you've got to have someone you hate sometimes. And then I'm that person. Mm -hmm. No, I I fully agree with you. Staying in something that is not serving you is much worse. And well, it wasn't safe either. So, right. Are you willing to talk about that? Only that he was six foot four and he got drunk and violent um as, as as time went on it wasn't like that in the beginning obviously mm-hmm. um yeah and and he was very he was very big so if he hit you it really hurt mm-hmm. and it just got worse and worse and worse mm-hmm. i'm sorry yeah me too mm-hmm. thank you mm-hmm. and the kids really suffered mm-hmm. through that process mm-hmm. my son was uh, 11 and he wasn't his child so he was really you know it was hard. Mm. I think this is it. I mean, we talk about having this sort of okay TikTok trad wife trend about you know oh you know why is everyone knocking the traditional like kind of like wife? It's because they haven't been there. It's like the same thing I say to my kids. I'm saying my daughter, my elder daughter, is living with her boyfriend, which traumatizes me completely because my inner Indian is really you know. And he's the loveliest guy. And I'm just like, if you hurt my child, I will come get you. He's like, <laughs> so, yeah. and she's like, Mama, stop scaring him. And I'm like, no. <laughs> but, you know, and, and we have these conversations because they're having to work out how they live together and how they spend money together and all these things. And I'm like, Simi, remember where we came from? Remember. You know, and she's like, yeah, I remember, Mama. And we, we go through that because we remember that helplessness, that stage of, and I made that money that we lived in. I just wasn't looking after it because I was busy having babies. Mm-hmm. And so I opened myself up to that kind of abuse. But mm-hmm. traditional wives, you talk to, I talk to young girls, they're like, yeah, you still believe in women. And I'm like, no, 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 it's not that. I, I 100,000% believe in women with every step and every breath I take. But I don't think until you've been helpless, responsible for another life, you understand what it's like to be trapped. Mm-hmm. And so you can't, let people need to find their own mm-hmm. journey. I mean, if we lived in a, perfect society where sure man goes to work women takes care of the house i mean 
it sounds like a utopia, right? Like everyone has their responsibilities. Only if that works for you. That well, like this utopia. is it. And sometimes it works for you and then all of a sudden it doesn't. Yeah. And then where does it leave women who have dedicated their time to raising families to then, like, what happened to your career? What happened to your financial independence? Like, you're, you're so vulnerable. You're completely dependent. And then your choice is to stay in a very potentially abusive and relationship and so many women do and so many women I, do from my the people that I hung out with when I walked out on my husband the number of women that should have and could have and would have well not would have didn't it was I promise you it's on two hands mm -hmm. and they didn't because they they wanted the, they, they made choices mm -hmm. to look after give their kids a lifestyle to give themselves the lifestyle and you know I don't want to judge them for that that's their business mm -hmm. But but it, it it is it is a lack of understanding on how you can be left helpless. Because mm -hmm. even if you've done everything right, this is the thing that people don't understand. Even which is what happened to me. Mm -hmm. Even when you've done everything right, it can all still screw up completely and leave you on the street with three kids and a bag of nappies. Mm -hmm. No, it can. And then what do you do? So, what do you think is? the solution to this? Oh, I don't think there is. I think that every generation has to be very... Oh, okay, maybe the only solution I think there is is what I do, is being very open. I'm very open about what it was like. I'm very open about how I was judged. I'm very open. I spent four minutes on my Instagram. I'm very open about these things. And that, I think, is the only thing you can do. Information is your only gateway to freedom. So let me give you all the information I can, and then you can make choices, you know, yeah. about about what you want to do. Because it's like, oh, you married money. Well, if A, I bloody didn't. B, I grew up with a lot more money than I married. You know, and, and, and that didn't leave me homeless. I made that money, and I still was left homeless, you know? So there are so many things you can try and try and try and try. And if the universe thinks that this is a lesson that you need to have, Rob, that lesson is coming to you and there's nothing you can do about it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I mean, for me, I think what the solution is, is A, educating women about how to be financially independent, regardless I of... knew that. So... I knew that. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm really clear. I knew that. Mm -hmm. I was making millions. I just had it in a joint bank account. And what happened? Oh, he emptied them, didn't he? And then we never found it. And then there were a whole bunch of bankers that helped him do that. Mm -hmm. And a bunch of judges that believed him when he said he didn't. But I, I knew that. Mm. I'm really, really bright. I knew all that shit. So your sense of injustice must be so, like, it's there, like, burning. Well, no, because that requires a lot of anger. Right, and I, I've, I've worked through that process mm -hmm. where I'm not angry anymore. Now, more of the stuff, as you can see, that I'm dealing with are the emotions for how I had to manage and deal with, which are things that I never had time to deal with. I guess maybe that'll happen now. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't feel angry anymore. I, I don't. Um, I, I couldn't talk about it this way if I still had anger. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember <laughs> some idiot friend of mine going, "This is the best thing that will ever happen to you," and I was like, "I will literally sl stab you if you sit here." <laughs> He's still alive. And I mean, you know, we had that conversation like five years ago and he was, I was right, wasn't it? And I was like, yeah. I mean, there could have been better ways. One of the things it taught me is that I would literally, my prayer became, God, please let me learn my lessons with less pain. Mm -hmm. Whatever the lesson I had to learn, let me just learn it without as much pain. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I'm not angry, but I, I am very committed. And how, does, how do I help another woman who doesn't have a voice? So looking back on that situation, what, if anything, would you have done differently? I never think like that. Mm. I honestly never think like that. Well, say you're advising then instead somebody else who's going through that or potentially to avoid them being in that situation. Mm. Like, would you, would you have your own separate account? I did. I did. I just didn't. I, um, what I would have to say then is don't trust. And I don't know if you should say that. Mm. Right. I, but, but OK, here's the way we could put it. I trusted based on the relationship my parents had. Mm -hmm. And that's the model I used. 
and actually look at the man that you're with and look at what his model was because that's how he'll behave and you'll behave your model he'll behave his model and you want to make sure that you stay safe whether it's financially or physically or whatever it is within the model that he thinks is acceptable i was very open and honest and transparent because that's how i grew up mm. it's how i grew up and i shouldn't have been because he wasn't open and transparent and honest and that wasn't his modus operandi um, but, you know, there were this, the odd things. And I was having babies and we were married and we'll work it out and, you know, all of this stuff. Mm. So it's not paying attention to the red flags. That. Hmm. Yeah. Not paying attention to the red flags. Not even knowing what red flags were at the time. But, yeah, definitely not paying attention to the red flags. I guess also another way of looking at it, like that was your experience then. But, you know, you're you're not destitute. You're not on the streets now. You know, you have a thriving family. You know, you're, 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 you're really adding to community. So in one way, having that open heart and still having the trust and also the knowledge that if you can do it before, you can do it again. Yes. And that's almost in a way why it's really hard to say what would you do different or sh- what should you do. I try never to say that. I'm, I'm, I'm look for I succeed in not telling people what to, unless you're my child, in which case let me totally. <laughs> Here is the list. <laughs> <laughs> which they don't pay any attention to anymore. So mm-hmm. I've had to give up that too. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I think that honestly, my biggest piece of advice would always be know yourself. Really know yourself clearly. You know, my father used to always say, I don't mind who else you lie to, which I'd prefer you didn't do, but please don't lie to yourself. And I was like, okay, so I have a really high level of self-awareness of how stupid I can be, how not, where I am, where I don't. And and I tried very hard to work on those things in me. And the honesty really did serve me well. People were kind to me. People were shitheads as well, because you lose a lot of money and suddenly no one wants to talk to you. People took me in, people were kind to me, people helped me, people said no, people stopped talking to me, people never wanted to see me again, people I've been on holiday with, I've flown out on my plane to my home in Monaco, never spoke to me again. You know who your real friends are. You really learn, you learn. The thing is, I grew up, as I said, with a lot of money, so my 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 I never valued myself on money. Mm-hmm. I've never valued myself on how much money I have, I don't have, and I'll never value you on how much money I have and I don't have, and I really don't care. I do care if you're a raging shithead. I really care. <laughs> and a lying, raging shithead. Do you think you have a better reader now? Oh, dearie me. Really, I find I find every somebody once said, don't tell me to learn from my mistakes. I find new ones to make every time. <laughs> um, I do. I have a lot more clarity now, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm willing to talk about something and be open. And then I'm like, yeah, no, no, no. You know, um, no. I remember dating and having this guy that would turn up and disappear every six weeks sort of thing. I remember just sitting there once and him going, hi. And me going, listen, explain to me how this works. If you were trying to date me, you would want to see me more than once every six weeks. And even if you were my friend, you'd want to see me more than once in every six weeks. You clearly don't want to do either of those things. Why did you call me? And there was complete silence. And he said, that's actually really good advice. Thank you. Let me go and think about that. I was like, see you soon. Or not, you know, but but yeah, you get very clear mm-hmm. and that can be intimidating. Mm-hmm. I don't know why, but I suppose it's intimidating if you want to use bullshit as an approach. Manipulation. It's very hard. It might even be a subconscious one where if if you're behaving in a way that is maybe less than good and other people accept it, then it gives you that permission to keep doing it. 100%. Whereas when you face somebody who's like, you know what, I kind of see through it and I'm not buying it, then all of a sudden you're, oh, okay, well, it didn't work on that person. What's wrong with me? <laughs> so it can be very painful to to see that. Oh, I hope so. Back to you. Yeah. One good phrase I've heard is like, be the, be the buyer, not the seller. As in oh, like be the, one that chooses. the chooser rather than the chosen. Yeah, one thing that did for me was before I got married because I had a babies and I was, you know, like just let's, you know, and I was, I, I honestly, I look back at my children's father and I couldn't, I don't know that he was necessarily the love of my life, but it was, you know, he was a nice steady duh to all of that shit. I'm obviously, I was obviously really not competent at this decision making, but I was just settling, mm-hmm. you know, I was settling and I look now and I'm like, I just have a very clear definition of what it is that I want and who I want to do it with mm-hmm. and who I want to be with. And it's very funny because I live in a very different strata now and the kind of men that I meet and that we, I, 
was lovely man. And he was like, Brigitte, come on. And I'm like, no, no. He was, but I'm rich and famous. And I'm like, I know, sweetie, and I love you so much. But, you know, and he was obviously taking the pets. He wasn't being mm-hmm. as bad as that sounds. Well, with every joke, there is a, a little truth. A little. I was laughing and I was like, yeah, I, I know, love. And I love you so much. But yeah, no, you know, because you can clearly see, no, mm-hmm. you know. Well, you've 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 covered your red flags now, and then it's like going deeper. So, what like what is the core essential things that you need? I feel like all of the story is leading up to W Corp, because like all of the your life experience is culminating in supporting women and creating environments where they can thrive, in spite of what the current societal structures. That have been created so i'm not a fan of current societal structures it must be said neither am i <laughs> so you know it's i feel like on that like it's like we're it's a meeting of minds for you and me i i, I do have a bit of a complaint about this there are, i'm a coach right and i've been coaching for 12 years but i coaching full time from when i hit when we hit the pandemic i love my job i love my job i was so happy and i coach really senior amazing like 20 there are 19 women that share a nasdaq company and i've coached two of them there are 22 women that have done ipos and i've coached a few you know i coached the, these globally famous women and then i coached normal women and from both extremes i friggin love doing that i was like i'm so i'm like a pig in muck this is me last year thinking love this i can do this for the rest of my life i'm actually making a shit ton of money i get to keep it because I don't have to pay for the schooling. I don't have to pay for the this. I don't, I mean, they're still horrendously expensive, but I get to keep this money. And the universe was like, yeah, think again. And I was like, oh, okay. So I was dragged into this kicking and screaming. I did not want to. I don't want to save the world. I, it really, there is no part of me that doesn't think a Chanel handbag and a martini would just improve my bloody life. My deep attempts to be frivolous and shallow have, have just not worked. And that's how I ended up here. Mm. So talk to me about W Corp. What is that? And so have you ever read something and your life was never the same again? Yes. Right? Have you? So I was reading about, as I was happily in my pig and muck days, which was only last year in April, sadly, um, I, I was reading a story, of a, a newspaper article about Crispin Odie, who ran Odie Asset Management, and they, these women kept trying to sue him for sexual assault and rape and never got anywhere because they'd end up in front of a judge who would slap him on the wrist. And just all this shit that they never, ever, um, they never, ever, he would just pay somebody some money. He was our own Harvey Weinstein type thing. And I was reading that these five women got together and they finally got him uh, into court. They finally made charges stick with this absolute ass. And I remember reading this this court transcript and it went something like, it may not be exact, but it was something like the, the receptionist on the top floor saying that when he left to go down, they would ring down so that the women could actually hide behind a locked door before he got there. Wow. And I, I just couldn't, I couldn't move from that. I couldn't step away from that. I couldn't, I couldn't bypass that knowledge. And there's a lot of really terrible things that I try really hard not to hear because how can you survive everyday life? Just there are so many tragedies in the world. And I, I, couldn't, I, I, I couldn't get past it because what do you as a woman know about these women? That they desperately need the money. They can't find other work and that they have no one to complain to. Mm-hmm. There is no higher authority that they can go to and say, help us. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, I, 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 I can't. I can't do this. And then... And that stayed in my brain. And then when Gaza happened and the, the, the fight with Israel and Gaza, and I looked at, and I have a lot of Jewish uh, friends. In fact, I don't know really, I think I know maybe one Palestinian. I don't actually know Palestinians. But all I could hear and all I could see was that it was the women and the children that had no choice ever. And I, I just, I couldn't cope with it. And I was, I was like, what do I do? How do I help? How do I make a difference? How do I change things? But I couldn't go into government because governments don't run countries anymore. Organizations do, right? If you can't make an organization even pay tax, you are of no use to anyone. And our governments are just not people that I am looking up to or being inspired by on any level. And they feel very toothless to me. And that's where it came from. And I was just sitting there thinking, I, I, 
I will create these courses to empower women. I'll run these things because I do, do the coaching and, you know, I'm effective at it. Let me. And I remember sitting with, a, and I was like, there must be a better way. And I was sitting with a girlfriend having dinner. And I'm like, I just need a better way to do this. And she said, if only there was some kind of certification, you know, for empowering women in, and, and companies had to, to say we're empowering women. And my brain blew up. And I was like, and she was saying like W core and my brain blew up and I was like, oh my God, W core. And I walked away from there and I was like, that's it. And so, um, and then how the universe helps. So I had data for 21,000 women over like 15 years. And then I rang up Forbes who I had been doing, had done, they'd interviewed me and they, they kind of had, had, we knew each other from someplace. And I said, they had done the piece of work with 75,000 women. I'm like, can I? can I have that data? And they were brilliant and gave me the data. And so there I am with 96,000 women's data. And I'm looking at this. And I'm a lawyer, right? So actually, ultimately, you're kind of an analyst. You're used to reading boring shit and coming to a conclusion. And I was like, okay, how do I do this? So first I thought of TED Talk, then I thought of this. And I was just like, no, no. Really what we have to do is women go through life changes. And those life changes are never represented within a workplace. Because workplaces work from nine to five where you work and then you home from five to nine. There is not one woman in the world that does that. There just isn't. And there's not one mother in the world that can do that. And society pays a price for trying to force women into that place because we get the lowest birth. We have huge numbers of countries that are never going to recover their birth rates. We have a lot of price we're paying for this. Um, but some very simple changes in the way work works would help us a great deal. And the way to think about it is there's no competition, there's no beating up the men, there's no blaming people. It's our, it, honestly, I think this is about us. Mm -hmm. It's our responsibility, it's not our fault, it's our responsibility. And it's up to us to change it. You build a, a, a loo for men, you put a urinal. You build a loo for women, you put toilets. It's very simple. Does anybody ask you not to do that? No, that's what this should be. We should have infrastructure in place that just enables women to be women. Can I just build on that analogy? Because this whole toilet thing really drives me crazy, which is where gender inequality really shows up. You're in a theater, you go into the bathroom, you've got what, five, ten minutes max. And a queue of six And a queue women. of women lining up. And then, you know, and the men just like, you know, I, the other day we went to the local theater and I'm there trying, and there's a like tiny, tiny little space. And I'm trying to like find my sp my, my, my spot. And a man is walking past me and just like looks at me, like looks at me, I'm like, like, like basically saying to like shoo me to the side. It's like, can you just wait in the, in, in like in the line up in the queue here? And I'm like, how dare you? You're going freely into your bathroom. That's going to take you like 15 seconds to go. Whilst I'm lining up here with all these other women, can't, there's not even space for me in the hallway to make space. Like, how dare you do that? And like, okay, we'll put, five, put three toilets for women, three urinals for men. And it seems like it's fair. No, but it's not. Like the whole but this is structure it. it's not of it needs to change. Do you see what I mean? It's an infrastructure issue. There isn't anything there about being a feminist, about caring, about even this man. He just doesn't understand because he's never no. had to go to the loo in this way. So if we just take all the emotion out of it and we take all the drama out of it and all that crap and blame, which is the real thing we have to take mm -hmm. out of this, what we just need is an infrastructure issue. Mm -hmm. For me to have no running water in the kitchen is stupid. For me to have no storage in the kitchen is stupid. For us to not understand that women have periods is stupid. For us to not understand that and a hundred percent of women go through them. A hundred percent of women go through perimenopause for eleven years. A hundred percent of women go through menopause. And a shit ton of women go through uh, maternity and childcare, and what is it? Sixty-eight percent of women look after elderly parents. That's still a, a majority of women, right? So if you don't think that fifty percent of the world needs to be reflected reflected in this infrastructure, that's like saying not even. Let me give you a loo with only three seats. Let me give you no women's loo because the women can just go around the corner. That's what that's like. Mm -hmm. But we're not understanding it. So my skill set is let me give you a problem and give you superior clarity over it so you can't run away from the clarity of it. And then when I went around doing all of this and I remember my daughter take me to dinner going, mommy, don't focus on anything else. You know, you're an entrepreneur and you're just going to run, just do this. It's really important. I was like, yes, dear, I'm doing it. And then she got fired. She is a student. So she's working in a coffee shop and she has two shifts a week. So the first shift she goes to, she started her periods with the second shift and can't move. 
cannot move. So she misses that shift and she misses the first shift of the following week. And so she's fired. And it is legal for them to fire because, of course, it's my child. She rang ACAS. It's legal for them to fire her. And I'm like, see? Why? Because there's no... In hospitality is my biggest bugbear on this. We'll, I'll, I'll, I'm coming to them soon in a cinema mm-hmm. near them. We'll get there. So there's the infrastructure. So it's the practical, you know, like the toilet situation. There's the practical thing. But then, which is the hardest, which is the mental thing. It's the, which is what we go to. So what we... Well, we, what we, our goal in W Corps is we've created a series of measurements and KPIs that organizations have to go through to understand whether or not they meet certification requirements. And what are those measurements? They are a variety of things, that, but they are all come from what women need in order to stay at work. So what, how to create a safe and supportive workplace for women to succeed in. That's the tagline. And the reason for that is that, for example, as a lawyer, you go from school to work, 50% men, 50% women-ish. It's 49, 51, usually women. Mm -hmm. Five years down the line, 30% of those women have left. Did they not need the money? Did they not want to go to work? Were they lazy? No, they they, couldn't. They changed their minds. (laughs) Simple. Mm -hmm. They couldn't stay. So we create measurements to let those women go through. Because I've done all the leadership coaching and I'm still doing it. And thank you, God, I love that. But we need something in the middle. And and McKinsey calls it the broken uh, rungs. uh, And there's another broken pipeline. We call it all kinds of rubbish. It's not broken. Broken implies it's not working. Actually, it's only not working for women because it's not a broken pipeline for men. So what we do is we will ask you things like, um, what is your flexible leave policies? What happens with parental leave? What happens with um, when women have periods? How do you measure something when you're not sick, but actually you can't come to work? Have you got other times you can work? And when you're in perimenopause, there are just parts of the day you can't function. Same as a woman who actually has stood up to make a speech in the middle of perimenopause and I could not remember the last thing I had said. Mm-hmm. And I was talking to 400 women and it, people and it was the most terrifying thing that's ever happened to me. Mm-hmm. So a lot of women talk about the fact that they, you know, perimenopause affects their brain function, but they're afraid to say it. So I want it codified in policy. So you can be a nice boss and you leave and then there's a shit boss and then I have to start begging. No, I don't want to have to ask you. I want it to just be like, I can see this mic. I can see this toilet. I want to see this policy and that policy is in place. So DEI is great, but our job is to make sure your DEI works. We literally tick the box and say your DEI actually worked. So we will say, how do you advertising? uh, What kind of results do you get in advertising? Oh, 70% men, 30% women. That is not an accident. It's because your advertising needs work. And what do you mean it needs work? Do you understand that women don't go for promotion naturally? How do you help women to go to a place? So part of it is a mindset experience, large part of it. And then some of it is whatever I can put into policy. And as we grow and iterate, we'll be able to more successfully put more stuff into policy. I was talking to Elizabeth, who is the one who put us in touch. And this was a little while ago. I don't know whether you were already collaborating or not. And I was like, what? What can I do as a as a headhunter advising female candidates when you go for a job interview somewhere and you're like, where should I go? Like what, you know, anywhere that has a W core stamp on it. Well, this is this run, is, don't walk. This is it. And I was like, what's the criteria? And I was like, we were like racking our brains. I was like, well, what you know, how do you quantify that? And then when she mentioned what you were doing, I was like, this is it. Yes. This is this is it. Like that's the stamp of approval. Then you know that's the place to go to. And I, I was thinking with my daughters and, and the women their age, what you do is you can go to an organization which has a W core stamp on it and you know you don't have to take on that fight. Mm-hmm. You can just get on with life. Mm-hmm. Then the other part of this, I mean, for me, this is the womanist movement. And it came because people I get interviewed all the time, they'd be like, Are you a feminist? And I'm like, love feminism, grateful, appreciate it. That was then. Mm-hmm. And now, and I couldn't find a word for it. And then I was like, I'm a womanist. I'm pro-woman. So I called it womanist. So then the the, the women, that's the B2B side. Then the women element of this WCOM, which is the, the woman community. And in WCOM, what we do is we put the women in there. And that is a global platform for women. It's a global trade union. I want to put as many women on there across the world as I possibly can so that there is a place for you to come to and go, my company is not paying attention. I am being traumatized here and I don't know how to help. I'm, this is happening to me. I'm alone and I, don't know, and I want to create a global platform and have women be able to come onto that platform 
because I think women's rights are starting to reverse in what uh, way? In, in, in many ways, like this abortion battle in the US. Mm-hmm. You know, um, female genital mutilation has just been put back in law in a couple of countries on the African continent. It is actually a really big problem. And I... What is it to do with? I think that it's geopolitical. I think that when you feel... Men run the world, right? Men run the world. Mm. When you're feeling either poor or threatened, Mm. you you kind of close down your home. You batten down your hatches. And so the safe place is is to control everything you can and if you can control your women you feel like you want something mm-hmm. i mean the abortion ban in the u.s is totally different it's because white people aren't having babies in the u.s anymore mm-hmm. and so they just need more well, you know what a great way to incentivize to women to have children right so it's yeah. but it's a male male policy mm-hmm. not and then you know just a stupid male policy mm-hmm. have you had any backlash from men about w court so the only backlash i've had is from actually women uh, two women, both of whom are lawyers, because they were explaining how their law firm was utterly amazing and just so good. And how this, and you just look at the, and you know, you just know that if you, they're at the top of their, their thing. If you go down, statistics are insane. If you, if you go down, further down the chain, there will be a very different story. But because they don't, so there's a thing what women, successful women do, they come back from maternity leave before six months are up mm-hmm. and they pay that price. Mm-hmm. And it's a high price and they pay it and they stay at work. And because they do that, they succeed and it shows they succeed. Whereas women that take longer for maternity leave, only 24% of them actually come back. Of that 24% that come back, nearly 80% then leave within two years Mm -hmm. because it's so difficult, Mm -hmm. right? Because you get sidelined of all these things. So women have not, uh, men have never pushed back, not even once, because it's a very logical scenario what I'm presenting. What did the women say when they pushed back? Not 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 in our company. Isn't it interesting that the gender bias exists, and we often think that it's required to the men. No, we I mean, we're indoctrinated in this system. All of us are operating, even women. Like it's hard to see the wood for the trees. Well, it was well, well, yeah. That's why I'm here because I'm like, here's the wood, here's the trees. <laughs> but that's like a Margaret Thatcher thing. If I can do it, why can't you? Mm-hmm. Because I'm not you. And because I don't want to pay the price you paid. And because I don't want to do, you know, and, and it was one woman was particularly vicious. And was like, this isn't even new, is it? It's nothing new. Someone must have done this before. Don't talk. I mean, I can't believe you. And this is a woman who came on a ball because somebody had said, go to her, she'll help you. And I was like, whoa. I was highly taken aback by that. And I had to kind of stop and go back and, and like cry into my oat milk and come back again because that was really quite took me aback and then we all carried on but you know no not one man has said that but a woman has interesting and i'm not going to lie about that because i think we should understand that sometimes women are our adversaries Mm -hmm. do you think it's a generational thing for women i think that if i tell you as a woman the price i've had to pay to get here and be successful I don't want you to judge me and I feel bad about the price I've had to pay, so I'm going to pretend it didn't happen. Mm. You know, so when you've got the woman whose baby goes and sits in a preschool club and then in a, then at school, then a post-school club mm-hmm. because it's the only way you can do your job and you just sucked it up and you went with it, that is, a, I mean, that's horrible, right? Mm. I have friends who had these insane careers and their babies at three months old were being carried like this and given to a childminder. Um, at three months, you know, it's like it's almost too painful to admit. So you just kind of like close that off. Yeah. Yeah. I understand that. Or sometimes it takes a while. And I've um, spoken to women who essentially, I mean, they don't like they say, I will still do the same thing again, but it has come at a price of either having a very successful career or having that time with your kids. And even though they don't regret it, it's still like you can see that it's yeah, know, something can't. that they're undoing it. They're undoing it in the later years of their children's lives. And I think you can't regret it more than you mm-hmm. don't. I think you do, but you mm-hmm. can't. So we've, we've, uh, you know, we're having yes. these conversations because my job, I think, is to push conversations people mm-hmm. won't have. So we have a whole series of conversations we're having at the moment on LinkedIn called Womb versus Work, you know, because we're being forced to make a choice. Mm-hmm. If you choose your womb, you're not going to then be able to choose work. Mm. So in the perfect world, a woman who chooses to, you know, she, she's smart, she's great, well-educated, 
you know, she she wants she's going places. She wants to have a career. You know, she's determined or even a business um, in the perfect world. What does what does work need to do to ensure that she can have she, she can be a woman <laughs> with children? Do you, see, do you see? You have to reframe that so she can just stay being a woman. Strategically, think of it this way. What we we've gone back from that old concept of you went to one place and you worked there forever. But in fact, statistics show us that when women have babies, they want to stay in one place. They want to, I was thinking of who's it, who has a residency in Vegas, um, Celine Dion. Mm-hmm. And I was laughing about it because she stayed there with the kids to go to school. And I was like, God, that's a high price to pay. But anyway, but <laughs> you want to be in a place where these women want to stay in the same place. You would have their commitment and loyalty forever. But why not think of it this way? Why not have the baby grow as the same time as your career and have it in the same place? Why was that such why is that such an amazing concept? Indra Nui, the CEO, was it Pepsi? She was saying, she was like, you know, make childcare easier. Make it so that there's childcare in my bloody building. Yeah. Make it so that if my child is sick, they can be sitting here and I can be too. And I mean, those are before pre-COVID days. Mm-hmm. But don't assume because my child's sick, I can't work. Mm-hmm. I'm not sitting here looking at the child. I just need to be in the same building as the child. Mm-hmm. Right? So instead of taking my child to work, let me be at home and do that shit. But don't devalue what I'm doing because of the place and the way in which I'm doing it. Yeah, because it's been done for so long in a one template. Like you turn up, you're completely focused, there's no distractions, you go home, your wife makes you a meal. That's, I was going to say, a very masculine approach. Well, this is it. I mean, that is, that is the template to which we are conforming. Because that's the only, that's just how it's been done. It's just been done like that, you know, like that's all we ever know. But women, for technological advancements as a result of war, and physical, have entered the workforce, and it does, that model does not fit. It does not fit. And you, as a woman, who can contribute so much to society, to you know, economy. You're being forced out because that framework just doesn't work. Which is stupid. It, it is Because stupid. if we <laughs> built a house with the windows were wonky, we would straighten the windows. You know? So actually what I'm saying with W Core is it's to everyone's benefit. It's not to one person's benefit because there are statistics upon statistics upon statistics that show that companies make more money that the universe makes more money. There's $12 trillion that would get added to the economy if there was equality of diversity in the workplace. Mm-hmm. You know, as in, in, in just simple diversity of, of masculine and, and feminine, you know, having that in. So if you just see it as, honestly, for me, it's an infrastructure issue. Mm-hmm. It's just an infrastructure. This infrastructure doesn't work. This infrastructure does work. Mm-hmm. And it's not like paint. It's not like I like this paint or I don't like this paint. It's infrastructure. So whoever the boss is, whoever the colleague is, whoever your line manager is, it just is not relevant because women are really bad at asking for what they want. It is not relevant. Put it, bake it into the infrastructure of the business. Et voila. Mm. Where do I sign up? (laughs) 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 Wcorporation.org. And then in WCOM, we want to move all the women because that's the organization. So we want to move all the women into WCOM, and in WCOM it's one dollar a month. Um, and we just want to put as we're, we're inputting, like we're talking to 1.2 million women in the middle of East Africa at the moment, 20,000 in India. We're talking to 15,000 in Malaysia, and we're just slowly going to input as many women as we possibly can into WCOM, and then start creating it as a global platform where we can just talk with each other mm-hmm. and trust the sources that we have. That's amazing. I mean, I. I hope it works. It has to. I mean, it needs to. For all our sakes. Yes. Really. Yeah. So and there's nothing no pressure on you. <laughs> I wanted to be a coach. You see why I started the conversation saying I loved my bloody job. <laughs> you know, and there's a place but but yeah, we can't I can't live through another day, hour or a minute where a woman can't be heard. And she needs to be heard. Um, you know, I, I can't. I'm very blessed in that I am very clear and and I'm really undismissible on some levels, but not all women are. So if we are undismissible, then it's our job, I think, 
to, to make sure that our concepts and ideas are undismissed. Mm. Kita, thank you so much for coming onto the show. Honestly, I think what you're doing with W4 is is exactly what's necessary. And I'm like mind, body and soul, like sold on, on, on your idea. You. So anything I can do to support you, send me companies. It's a land grab at the moment. It's the first year and that's always the judgment mm -hmm. that first year will take. And God, I'd forgotten how horrible startups were, but at least I've done five. So, you know, I've been there before, but it's just send me companies, send me companies. Mm -hmm. um, because the more companies, we have a map at the bottom of W Corporation. Um, and we put dots in for every company that signs up. So, you know, as many as as, as we can across the globe. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Nice to meet you. Lovely to meet you. Great. Yes. You've been listening to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. This week, I'd like to read a comment on Apple Podcasts that has been from one of my favorite guests, Angela Cretu. Engaging, insightful, wow. Maria senses, like no other, the experiences that needed to be revealed from each of her guests. She engages her audience with exciting topics and brings out the essence of what could be a game changer. As her guest, I deeply enjoyed her sharp, out-of-the-box questions and the overall vibe in her studio. My best podcast experience so far. Thank you so much, Angela. If you'd like for me to read out your comment, then head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. And if you're really struggling, then send me a DM on Instagram or LinkedIn and I'll send you a little video on how to do it. If you find these stories insightful, helpful and really want to support the show, the best thing you can do is to follow or subscribe. Thank you so much for listening and I'll see you next week.